And I just turned around and I hauled ass out of there. I was, I was done. I wasn't dealing with that. The hypocrisy of the cult is one of the things that turned me away the quickest. When I turned my headlights on, it turned and looked at us. And one of the things I remember the most were the eyes were glowing red. I see an orb of light. It is just circling these steps like it is waiting for me. And he begins to tell them uh, that he saw a UFO. They're basically like, what are you talking about? That's seven foot up on a tree, peeking around it. And that's where I saw the top of the muzzle, nose, and the eyes. As soon as I made eye contact with this thing, it felt like death. Welcome back to Tinfoil Tells. I'm your host, Brandon Wright. Tonight's episode, we're going to be joined by my guest, Matthew Knapp. Matthew is the host of Bigfoot Crossroads. If you're not familiar with that, I definitely recommend checking it out. If you're a fan of Tinfoil Tells, you'll probably be a fan of Bigfoot Crossroads, too. We do similar things. Matthew used to be a Bigfoot researcher, and then he got into the whole podcasting thing. We've been talking back and forth for a while, so we thought it'd be a good idea to do a little bit of cross-promoting. He's going to be on an episode of Tinfoil Tales, and I'm going to be on an episode of Bigfoot Crossroads, so make sure to go check that out. You can find links to his show in the show notes. But before we bring Matthew on, if you've ever had an experience and you would like to be on an episode of Tinfoil Tells, you can send an email to tinfoiltellspodcast at gmail.com or go to the website tinfoiltells.com. You can go to the contact section. Either way works for me, so just make sure you get a message to me and we will get you scheduled for a future episode. If you'd like to help the podcast out, please continue to share it around. Sharing the podcast is one of the best ways of getting the word out there. It finds new listeners. It helps find new guests. And just overall brings new awareness to the podcast. So for everyone that's been out there sharing it, I truly appreciate you guys. There wouldn't be a podcast without all the listeners. So everyone that's taking the time to share the podcast around, just know that I do truly appreciate you. You can also help out by leaving a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to Tinvoil Tells. If you're on Apple and you write a review out, I'll make sure to read it on an upcoming episode to give you guys a shout out for it. You can also help the podcast out by joining the Patreon, but you get access to all the episodes right after they're recorded. They're all ad-free. There's also some bonus content on there like Crinkled Conspiracies, the Patreon-exclusive show that I'm doing with my friend Ed that is only available on the Patreon. There's also a free tier, so if you don't want to pay the whole $1.99 a month, you can still get access to Crinkled Conspiracies and some of the other episodes in the free tier. Make sure to follow me around on social media. Facebook and Instagram is where I'm most active. Look for Brandon Tinfoil Tells on Facebook. You can talk to me that way too. There are a few events coming up this fall that I'll be appearing at. I'll have a vendor booth set up and I'll be speaking at a couple events too. The first one is September 14th. Bigfoots and Brews and Spirits too. And Dewajack, Michigan at the Sister Lake Brewing Company. I'll have a booth set up there at my recording rig. I'll also be at the Indiana Bigfoot Conference, September 27th and 28th. That's in Nashville, Indiana. I will also be at ParaUnity 6 in Miami County, Indiana at the 4-H Fairgrounds on October 19th. And then finally, on October 26th, I'll be in Crawfordville, Indiana for the Crawfordville Paranormal Convention. Again, at all those, I'll have a booth set up. I'll have some merch stuff. I'll have my recording rig. At the ParaUnity event and the Crawfordville event, I'll be doing guest speaking. So you'd like to hear me talk about some things in person, that'll be your chance to do that. Those two events are free. The other two do require tickets. You can find more information about those tickets by going to the show notes. But I think now it's time to bring Matthew on. I've been looking forward to talking with him. We chat back and forth quite a bit on Facebook Messenger, but now it's time to actually sit down and talk in person. So I hope you guys enjoy the conversation. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I'd like to take the time to welcome my guest today, Matthew Knapp from Bigfoot Crossroads. Thanks for coming out and talking to me. Yeah, man. It's nice to put a uh, a voice to it. We've been chatting a little bit recently, and uh, this is the first time we've actually talked. Yeah. That's uh, 
my life is behind either a, a text message or something for most of the time. Like people don't ever really know my voice unless they listen to the podcast or something like that. Cause I'm not an outgoing person in, in real life. <laughs> when I get a phone call, <laughs> when I get a phone call, I'm like, Ew, why are you calling me? Why don't you just text me? <laughs> oh, geez. You're one of those. Yeah. One of those uh, people. I like to maintain the wizard of Oz mystique myself and just try to avoid video at all costs. But I don't, I'm a talker. I'm a talker for sure. I can talk when I need to. I have to deal with a lot of talking for work purposes. So this is my outlet to not have to be in the normal routine. And then it's weird because I used to be the front man of a band. So I always had to talk to people anyways on stage. So I always say I'm not a outgoing person. I don't like talking to people. You got to do a podcast where I talk to people and I used to be <laughs> a, a front man of a band. So I was like, Maybe I actually do enjoy and I just think I don't. I don't know. Or you're just self-loathing and just do things you hate to do. That's that's actually probably pretty spot on. So there's that. But yeah. So uh, I know from talking with you, you used to be a Bigfoot researcher. You don't really do a whole lot of that anymore, do you? No, no. I hung up those boots years ago. Uh, I had quite a number of experiences, did it for probably a little over a decade and it just kind of got to the point uh for a long time i was able to just take off and go out to the woods you know and uh spend time doing it but then my life kind of changed and i couldn't spend as much time out there like i wanted to and at that point i kind of decided you know i've really accomplished everything i can accomplish uh at this point, I felt that to really advance in any facet of research, it would require a lot of time and money spent doing it. And I just didn't have the resources. And like I said, the, the life changes, I, I couldn't take off like I was. So I decided to start focusing on uh, the grind of the books and, you know, the former research that came before me and everything. And Ended up becoming a podcaster somewhere in the process. That is, uh, seems to be a trend I've noticed with people, even myself. They, uh, I don't know if it's our last resort <laughs> to, to do something. <laughs> we do other things and then they're like, all right, well, I'm, now I'm just going to do a podcast. But yeah, I don't know. I, I, I got involved in Bigfoot podcasting pretty early. Uh, whenever it wasn't really a thing before people were even calling them podcasts. And I, I really enjoyed it. I was, I, I kind of grew up around, uh, recording and stuff. Uh, I had a, a stepfather for a while that was a musician and learned about the studio and got into mixing and stuff. So that side interested me. And then I like to hear the stories and talk to people about Bigfoot, of course. And, uh, eventually just kind of ended up moving from the producer side of things to the host side of things. And yeah, did a podcast for a while called Bigfoot Outlaw Radio with a couple of well-known gentlemen from the South in the Bigfoot world. And I kind of had them in the spotlight doing the majority of the talking and I stayed behind the scenes, uh, most of the time. And then I uh, decided to branch out and do my own venture with Bigfoot Crossroads. You've been doing it for how long now? Oh, geez, man. <laughs> so this version of Bigfoot Crossroads is probably a couple of years old. Um, whenever I started doing podcasting on a regular basis, it was probably around 2004-ish. And then got real serious around 2008, I would say. And have been doing it consistently ever since. Back then, they weren't podcasts like you mentioned. I think they were vlogs. Blogs. I know yeah. People, yeah, there's a site they, called Blog Talk Radio. And, yeah. <laughs> and we had all just call in on our phones. And the whole thing was just done over the phone. And, yeah. Uh, it sucked. <laughs> it was horrible. I didn't live in the times of uh, being able to listen to stuff like that because back in those days, 
I had dial up internet. So right. it would have taken like five days for one thing <laughs> to download just to listen to it. So those were the dark ages for me. It yeah. wasn't until like 2007 to 2008, I think, is when I finally lived in an area where I could get cable internet. So I thought I was living in, in the future with how fast I, things worked and I could listen and watch things. And that was like the infancy of YouTube. Right. Back in the Wild West days of YouTube before they banned your videos over saying specific words or something. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that when the two guys were running it. Mm-hmm. Then, uh... I think Google bought them out and everything's changed since then. Yeah. It's a different monster. The monopoly of uh, the big corporations. But anyways, not trying to get myself banned again. Uh, <laughs> yeah, careful. <laughs> they're always listening. But no, so what, uh, what led you into wanting to look into Bigfoot? Uh, curiosity, honestly. I... I was always interested in just all the weird stuff, the unexplained stuff. Uh, my interest stemmed from being actively interested in the paranormal. Uh, my house had activity going on in it before I was ever around, before I was on this planet. Uh, and then after I was born, I experienced things of my own and my friends experienced things whenever they'd come over. So I was always trying to learn as much as I could about the subject and try to figure out, you know, what's going on. I think it helped me to not be afraid of it whenever it was going on. If I understood something, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, that's not always the case. Sometimes it's just scary. Uh, mm -hmm. but all, all that stuff back in the day, you know, you'd go to the library or you'd go to a bookstore and you'd be looking up, you know, books on ghosts and stuff. And every once in a while, you'd run across a book that had like Bigfoot stuff in it or the Loch Ness Monster. They just kind of put them all together. And that's kind of where I learned about Bigfoot. And then I uh, got a little paperback book about Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster at a uh, yard sale whenever I was a kid. And I read those stories. Uh, and it had some of the more, you know, famous tales in it, uh, you know, like Ape Canyon, and Albert Osman and things like that. And uh, I was like, wow, this is so cool. You know, there's like a monster living in the woods of the Pacific Northwest. And I really didn't think that much about it, honestly, afterwards. And then years later, I got my first uh, home computer, my first PC. And just exploring the internet, you know, looking stuff up. One night I typed in the word Bigfoot and all these websites popped up. I think there was a total of maybe seven uh, <laughs> where people were going out looking for this thing. And I, it just blew my mind. And they, they actively went out and tried to find it. And there were still like ongoing uh, sightings and stuff of the creature. And it was all over the world. It wasn't just in the Pacific Northwest. And that's really uh, what started it all for me. Did you ever have anything when you started looking? Did you ever get to actually see something? I know you said you had some experiences, but did you ever yeah. actually see yeah. a Bigfoot? Yeah. Um, kind of weird. Kind of <laughs> still looking back on it. Uh, it was 2002. I had been going out into the field researching for less than a year. Uh, <laughs> there's no way I should have had a sighting. I was with a group of people. It wasn't really a Bigfoot outing, but it was a, a, a group of researchers. We all got together to have like a camp out and a barbecue in this national park that had a history of sightings. And some people that we were friends with that lived in the area were kind of taking us around to some of the different spots where sightings had happened, where believed activity was taking place on a pretty regular basis. And one of those spots was a, uh, a parking lot or a nature center is what they called it. It's basically like a, a tourist building, you know, people that come into the park can go in this building and 
get information about the park. You know, they've got brochures and souvenirs and stuff, and they've got a few animals on display that you can find in the area. But whenever this place closes down at night, uh, you've got this empty parking lot, and it's nestled in this forest. It's not like on a main highway or anything. And there's trash cans in this parking lot, and supposedly the Bigfoot would raid the trash cans on occasion. People would report driving by the Nature Center parking lot and seeing something big and hairy digging in a trash can. So that's where we were. Uh, I wasn't really expecting anything. I'm in a parking lot, not my ideal surroundings to have a Bigfoot sighting. And there was a, a bunch of people there. We had split up into a few different groups and just kind of meandered away from one another into different areas. And there was this guy that I was kind of hanging back with who was using a night vision scope at the time. And uh, he just kind of like, hey, Matt, come look at this. Tell me if you see what I'm seeing. So I walk over there and he hands me the scope and I'm looking through the scope and he's kind of, I can see his finger in the scope kind of pointing where to look. And I see eye shine, these eyes reflecting back. And it's just inside the tree line and whatever it is, it's looking at me. And I'm looking at it and I'm trying to process, you know, what is this? What am I looking at? And uh, that's when I realized that those eyes were attached to a face. Uh, not an animal's head, but an actual face of some kind. Forward looking face. I was, I guess, probably in shock at that time. Just staring, processing, trying to understand what I was looking at. Uh, it wasn't an animal, but it didn't look like a person. And at first, you know, the thought crossed my mind, like, are, are these people like messing with, with me? Like, cause I grew up, we had a lake house and we spent all of our free time at that lake house. So I grew up hunting and fishing and running around in the woods by myself with my BB, BB my BB gun and a machete, just things that kids should not have. <laughs> and, uh, I was fairly knowledgeable about wildlife at this point. You know, I'm in my very early twenties and I've never seen anything. This isn't a bear. This isn't a deer. This isn't an owl in a tree. I see a face and this face has, you know, forward facing eyes. They're kind of almond shaped set very deep underneath a large brow ridge, uh, it had a very human looking nose. It just didn't have like the nose tip like we have. The nostrils were wide, slightly upturned, but not so much as like what like a gorilla would have, uh, but not as far down as like a human has. The mouth was wide. The lips were thin. The bottom lip was thicker than the top lip. It looked like it had an underbite. Like that was very pronounced. Like that stood out a lot to me, the underbite. Uh, the jawline was very wide and broad and muscular looking. The outer edges of the jaw were actually sitting out wider than the temples. Uh, the hair on this face looked like the same pattern as like if just a human male grew out his facial hair. Uh, it was kind of thinner on the cheeks and everything and kind of went down into a thicker beard. Uh, the hair, there wasn't like a forehead. It just kind of started at the brow ridge and just grew back over the top of the head. And there was a tree limb, like a branch, cutting across the bottom of its face. And then another one cutting across just over the top of its brow ridge. So I couldn't see like, the bottom of the chin and I couldn't see the top of the head. And this thing is just staring at me. At least it, it appears to be staring at me. That's what I'm thinking it's doing. It's looking towards our direction. Like it knew we were there, but it's not moving. Uh, every once in a while it would blink. I looked at it through this scope for what seemed like about four or five days, but I'm sure it was like 30 seconds. And I pulled the scope down and I'm looking at him and I'm like, is, 
is that a face? What, you know, I, I'm, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And I put it back up to my eye to look at it again. And it's just gone. No longer there. There is no sound, no movement, nothing. But the area where I had just seen it, the branch that was going across its forehead and the one going across where its chin were, were now closer together. So I think it was like holding down a branch and like looking through the hole at us and uh, just took the opportunity whenever I pulled the scope down and looked away to haul ass. And uh, yeah, my world was rocked at that point. Uh, took forever. I, I, I must have spent several months after the fact still trying to like, what could it have been? Is there any way that, you know, that was somebody in a mask messing with me. And, the, and there was just no way. Nobody knew that we were going to be there. Uh, th there's no way it was a person. Absolutely no way. And it uh, definitely <laughs> changed the course of my uh, research and my outlook on the subject uh, forever. And because of that, here we are having this conversation today. They always say when you see things, it changes your perspective. That's what I say too, because I've always been a skeptic, but when you see something that you can't explain, it really does make you really start to question everything you think, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I consider myself a skeptic. I think I became more skeptical after that because I took it way more serious at that point. You know, it, it wasn't just a story at that point. Mm -hmm. These things now I'm coming from the position of, I know that they're out there. I know this, it, this is a fact now. So I have to look at things differently, but at the same time, I know that previous to that, if somebody tells me that they saw a Bigfoot, I'm not just like, oh, well then Bigfoot must be real because this person says they saw one. I don't expect anybody to be like that. I don't expect people to be like that whenever they hear me talk about what I saw and my experiences. And I'm okay with that. Uh, I think everybody should be that way. Because the truth of the matter is, people can be mistaken. And people do make up stories all the time. And it's something like other things out there, whether it's the paranormal, UFOs, Bigfoot, whatever, it's something that I know you have to experience for yourself before you can actually believe that it's real. Because otherwise, I mean, how can you accept that, that you've just been living a life where there's these monsters out there that aren't supposed to exist and somehow they've managed to elude us for so long and all these things are going on all around us and they're not supposed to be there. It's, it's a lot to deal with. The struggle I have when it comes to believing in cryptids and everything else, and this is coming from someone who saw something, um, you kind of just alluded to a little bit. How are these things out there and they're so large and yet only a few people ever detect them? You don't really have any great footage besides... The Patterson Gimlin, there's such a big debate on if that's real or not. I kind of lean towards it's real just because when you see muscles moving and other things, it looks a lot better. And no one's ever produced a suit that I thought looked like that. Like I know someone's come out, so they made the suit and there have been several people, but they've never really, it never really added up to me. But when you go into it, the one question that always comes back to, there would have to be enough for a breeding population if they're a flesh and blood type of a creature. There's also have to be the food sources. There has to be where they're at. How come no one's ever ran one over? How come no one's ever had a body? Like there's always questions. There's more questions than answers. And that's where most people that are skeptical can say these things don't exist because for whatever reason, there's been no proof. So that's where I come into with my skepticism as well. There's no proof. What are people seeing? I don't believe everything is misidentification. Because what you just said is, you know, it's not a bear. You know, it's not another type of animal. So what could it be? And that's where you come back to is like, 
or is everyone making things up? Because what's what does anyone get out of making stuff up? Internet clout? Cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> why oh why isn't there any proof? And uh you know, different things, there's there's responses. You can argue either side of it, uh, honestly. You could argue that well, there's no way that there's enough for a breeding population. But then you could also argue, well, there's like, you know, if you compare numbers of like, uh, I mean, we'll say black bear in the United States, mm -hmm. where there's just thousands and thousands and thousands of them, how often do you actually see them? Right. Uh, especially if you live in a city like most people do uh, and don't really go out into the woods all that often. And if you do go out into the woods, it's for, you know, a weekend camping trip with your family, you're on vacation or whatever, uh, you, you're going in campgrounds that are heavily populated and everything. Not very many people spend a lot of time in the back country. And most people live their entire lives without ever seeing a bear, even if they live in an area that has 10,000 bears. Uh, so the number could be large enough for a breeding population, in my opinion, without them hardly ever being seen, especially if you consider that these things are very intelligent. Uh, we're not talking about just an animal. There's a lot of uh, speculation involved in that, but I would say the general consensus, uh, if you're a flesh and blood person, is that these things are a primate and they appear to be extremely intelligent. So that gives them an advantage, uh, certainly. Not having hit one or produced a body, some sort of specimen. Well, uh, you know, there's stories out there. There's a lot of stories of them being shot. There's a lot of stories of a, a potential cover-up going on, or at least to the extent that the government doesn't want to admit that they're out there and will do things to uh, hide the fact that they are, like confiscating bodies and things like that. But those are all just stories. It's all just part of the folklore. At the end of the day, don't know. <laughs> have <laughs> no idea. That That's one of the things that I've had to face. Uh, why haven't we? Because even with those things on the table, and uh, I have been confident <laughs> in my Bigfoot journey and my arguments on the side of explaining why we don't find bones, this and that. But at the end of the day, there's still that question. Okay, with all that being said, you know, humans are pretty lucky. We, we've gotten some pretty incredible photographs and videos of things that are very difficult to acquire. Uh, why hasn't, you know, a trucker late one night hit one on a logging road somewhere? Uh, why hasn't a hunter just walked across a dead one laying there? At some point, you have to ask what's really going on. You know, why haven't we gotten that proof yet? There are reasons why uh, that could possibly be the answer. But then there's also a lot of unknowns out there. And uh, at the end of the day, we might not be as smart as we think we are. And we might be dealing with something else entirely. There's a lot of opinions and speculation and everything. There's never been any concrete or conclusive or whatever you want to say but if you go the flesh and blood route and you can use you use bears for an example think about how many hunters go out there and you can ask a lot of hunters how often have they ever came across a carcass of a dead bear yeah it same doesn't happen like, very often same thing with a mountain lion now, if you're dealing with something that has high intelligence and some believe that they bury their dead, I can get behind that. So you're not going to see something if they bury their dead. No. But there's been times just from the field of what I do for work, we build highways, we build roads, we start excavating grounds, and we come across bones, our animals, and this and that. At some point, with all the way the world's been ripped apart because we continue to expand where humans live, wouldn't we have come across bones? And then I know there's stories of 
the giants or whatever people wanted to call them where they've had bones discovered. Are those really things? I have no idea. I mean, again, it's all just folklore. But there's been stories of giants and other things like that. Well, if there's giants and they're calling them giants, wouldn't that also qualify towards a possible Sasquatch? Because you're just looking at bones. And back in those days, I don't think anyone was an anthropologist to know what it exactly was what they're looking at. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, I, that's one of the things that's always kind of interested me is how we uh, visualize dinosaurs, for instance, based on their skeletons. Mm -hmm. We could be completely wrong. I mean, if, if you look at like the skeleton of a hippo, you're going to get a completely different creature than what it actually looks like. Yeah. And if you take the average person who's not an anthropologist and you stick them in a scenario, let's just say that family that went on vacation and went camping for the weekend. Well, let's go for a hike. Oh, I've got to take a piss. I'm going to step off trail here and take a leak. Oh man, here's some bones. That must be a deer or a bear or something. Look, honey, I found the skeleton of like a bear or something. Isn't that cool? All right, let's go. I mean, bones could have been found. And nobody had even recognized them for what they are because it it's highly unlikely that you would run across any sort of like complete skeleton or anything like that. And most people wouldn't even know what they were looking at anyway. So it doesn't really matter. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's totally out of the realm of possibility that people have stumbled across bones and things like that and just not even known what they were seeing. I also think it's possible that People have had encounters with these things and because they're not knowledgeable on local wildlife or being out in the woods or anything like that, they just write it off as a bear or something explainable because why would it be a Bigfoot? That's ridiculous. Some of the things I think about are when people say they're walking and they hear like footsteps. Well, again, that could be anything because you're in the woods. Right. And the things that get to me is when something's been thrown at them. Mm-hmm. If you're out in the woods and a rock comes flying at you, I don't know of any type of normal woodland animal that picks up a rock and throws it. I don't think yeah. a bear can throw a rock. They say there's tree knocks. I mean, I've heard random noises. I'm not going to say it was a Bigfoot because I know... What you're thinking is a knock could just be something else. Like a woodpecker sometimes could sound like a knock. Just depends on where it's at and how it echoes through the place. But I've never experienced anything because I'm not one that ever goes out in the woods and look for stuff. I used to back when I was a kid. We used to go out in the woods all the time. Up at my friend's house, there's a cabin that we found out in the woods one time too. And we went out there and did stuff that teenagers would go out and do that we're not going to talk about on air. But <laughs> And there was this old book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Necronomicon. But no, we um, we used to go out all the time, and I never once, ever as a kid, ever thought about running into a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot or whatever out in the woods like we're walking. My biggest thing was running into, like, people. And that was my... You never know who you're going to run out to in these woods. Some creep out here. And nowadays, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to run into anyways. <laughs> I'm not even worried about <laughs> the people these days. Yeah, whenever I was running around in the woods, there was one incident in hindsight that was really weird at least it was weird to me um but i never thought about you know sasquatch being out there or anything like that i think you know i might have used my imagination to think about werewolves a time or two and scare myself but that was about it uh but there was one time whenever i was in an area that i had never been before i was pretty deep in the woods uh and everything went quiet and that scared me and I was just standing there and then something large, I don't know what it was, took off right next to me. Uh, there's kind of a little clearing there and some like really tall grass about four or five foot tall and something was in that grass and just hauled it away from me. I don't know what it was. I just always assumed it was a deer, which probably that's what it was. Um, but other than that, it never really crossed my mind. Even whenever I was like reading stuff on it, the idea that 
uh, there was Bigfoot living right there. It was just unheard of, you know. I'm not in Washington or Oregon or, you know, Canada or anything. There's no Bigfoot in Oklahoma. That's ridiculous. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's where my sighting took place was in Oklahoma. So really had no clue. Um, but what's interesting about what you said is the night before the sighting, we had gone into a different area and there was rocks being thrown from the woods over our heads into the creek behind us. And at first, like I heard the splashing and everything. And I thought, well, that's, that's probably just some fish, you know, even though the creek where we were at was only like six inches deep, still a possibility. I'm just going to assume it's, it's nighttime. There's bugs landing on the water. It's fish. I'm used to it. But then you started seeing like, the, you know, you'd be looking up in the air because it was happening so much and you'd actually see a rock fly over your head and splash in the creek behind you. I mean, what do you do with that? So I'm standing there, uh, leaned up against this car hood, talking to my friend. We're facing the tree line. The tree line's just on the other side of the car. So maybe 10 feet away. And this rock about the size of like a small marble hits the hood of the car, bounces up, hits me in the stomach and falls back down on the hood of the car right in front of me. And I was just like, okay, what, what the hell? Like there's n <laughs> what throws rocks that, uh, and that blew my mind. And that was the kind of the turning point for me where I was like, holy crap, either somebody parked on the highway and hiked multiple miles through the dark in the woods without a flashlight to come throw rocks at us <laughs> and somehow knew that we would be in this location. Like nothing out there can throw rocks except for a person. Mm -hmm. And this isn't like a situation where like, Oh, it could have been a bird or a squirrel. It wasn't coming from above the trajectory hit the car hood and it bounced and hit me. So it came from the trees. No. And like, you could hear rocks like zipping through the leaves and stuff of the trees, how they threw a rock through the woods without hitting trees. That one is still a mystery to me. I don't understand, <laughs> but even that, like the next night I have that sighting and I realized even as much as I thought, I believed these things were real at that point. I, I had no clue. It was a whole different level. Like it, it, it changes you. 100%. How big would you say it was when you were looking at it? How tall do you think? Well, so that area, after I had that sighting, uh, one of the locals there, the same guy that I had been talking to the night before, whenever the rock hit me, he, he was, this park is right at the edge of the, this small town. And he lived in this town for years and years. His family was from there. And he and I became really close friends and he became like my research partner. It is about three and a half hours from where I live now. So it wasn't that far for me to travel. And I knew him and I met other people down there that I could stay with. So I was like, well, I've had a sighting here. I know they're here. So I'm just going to focus my efforts there. Why should I waste my time traveling around trying to find them blindly whenever I know there's at least one in this area. So that's where I started researching it. So that spot, I mean, I've been to it hundreds of times now, you know, I I've gone and like stood at the area where it was and everything and retraced the steps and everything. So that particular spot from where I was, it would have probably been in the range of six to seven feet not out of the realms of like a human by any means, but I mean, I'm six foot one and typically I'm taller or one of the taller people in any given group. There's really not that many people that go above six foot tall. So again, it's like the odds of it being a person, they would have been taller than me. And just randomly having a Bigfoot mask. I mean, everybody from my group was accounted for. So I, 
I don't know. I still think about it. Um, there was another incident that took place in the same area where I saw something else that was much larger, but it was, it stayed in the confines of the darkness. I didn't have a night vision scope or anything. So all I saw was basically a silhouette in the dark. But if that was one, that one would have been upwards of like 10 feet tall. It was massive. There was like a hiking trail. So you had, you know, all the limbs and everything cleared out. And it's this opening of a trail, however wide a hiking trail is. And whatever this thing was, it blocked the view entirely of the hiking trail behind it. Like I could not see past it. So it was every bit as wide as the trail. And I had a buddy of mine who was about five foot four or five foot six at the time, not a real tall guy, but I had him go stand in the area where this silhouette was. And there was this tree limb above him. And this thing, it looked like its head was kind of ducked down below it. Like it was kind of holding its head down. And this tree limb was about two of him high whenever I looked at him. So that tree limb would have been around the 10 foot mark a little bit more maybe. And this thing's head, if that's what it was, was just right below that tree limb. I can't even comprehend how something that large can just be around. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've thought there's like how, how can, and not just one, but like you were saying, you know, there, there's more than one, even if, even if you're talking about, if you don't think flesh and blood, if you go the route of, you think these things are interdimensional portal hoppers, whatever, even that belief still acknowledges that there's groups of them and that they at least can manifest physically if they want to. Uh, so how does something like that even like move around in the woods? You know, because like the thing I was looking at was four feet wide easily. And if you're walking through the thick timber, like, you know, that's kind of difficult as a human <laughs> with yeah. a normal size human. So like, I mean, I don't know, man, I don't have any idea. That's kind of, you know, that's where I start having a few issues trying to understand the stuff, especially whenever people start talking about, uh, you know, well, I saw one that was like, you know, 20 feet tall. And I'm like, dude, you could see that from Google. Like, are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, do you actually know how tall 20 feet is and like how wide that thing would like, it wouldn't be able to maneuver. It couldn't walk. It couldn't hunt. It couldn't do anything. Like it'd be eating cattle or something like that's insanely large. Uh, but whenever you hear things plowing through the woods, you know, snapping limbs and breaking stuff as it comes i mean it sounds like an elephant it sounds like a bulldozer coming through there so i, I don't know man i don't know I, i'm with you though how does something that big just exist out there without being seen all the freaking time you look at animals right now what we know exists the largest animals are like the elephant i don't know of anything and like a giraffe obviously but that's all neck so when you go into this, like size wise, I can't think of anything taller. Anything that's bigger, obviously, lives in the water. Yeah, that's that's not out walking around, right? And then I forget what it's called, but I know there's like the scientific law of whatever for size or same. But basically, the bigger something is, the more gravity it has, the harder it is for it to be of that size. Right. I've seen people saying that they've seen fifteen foot Bigfoot. Again, like you said, 20. The, does anyone know how tall that really is? I have a nine foot metal cutout of one out on my pole barn out back, and that looks huge on my pole barn. Can you imagine almost doubling that? Yeah, like, it's insane. One of the first things we ever did, uh, it was on my first real Bigfoot outing. It was down in Texas. And like the first day I was there, we went outside with a tape measure on a tree and we marked. 10 feet on the tree mm -hmm. 
just so everybody could get an idea of what 10 feet looks like. And I mean, I've, you know, played basketball and stuff. I know what a basketball goal is. Yeah. And, uh, but whenever you're standing there looking up at 10 feet marked on the side of a tree, that's insane, man. That's mm -hmm. insane. That's, that's looking, that's standing flat foot at the side of your house and being able to look on the roof. Yep. That's, that's crazy. Uh, I used to have that cut out all on my front right by the house. So literally the top of it was right over the edge of the roof. Yeah. So can, and that, I said, I think that's nine feet. So imagine 10 feet or another foot above that. Yeah. So just imagine walking through the woods and coming across something 10 foot. Like there's no way someone's not going to shit themselves. Just yeah. Like, that I mean like that definitely explains why you get some of the reactions from people you get, you know, whenever they've had a sighting. My friend had a sighting. He was, <laughs> he was a complete skeptic, man. He, my best friend. And, uh, he went on an outing with me down in Texas and, uh, he was going because he was my best friend and he was worried because I'm going out in the woods looking for an imaginary creature with a bunch of strangers. So he's going to go and bust this thing wide open and talk sense into me and all that. And we go down there and I mean, just the chain of events alone, like we're, it's just me and him, the whole car ride there. All we know is directions to the campground where everybody's meeting up at. Before we get to the campground, we're driving down this road and I'm like, man, that looks like a good area we should go check out later. Cause it was just a wooded area and it had a dirt road that just went off in there. Couldn't see where it went or anything, but it was right next to a spillway at a dam. So it had like water running through there and everything. And it just looked boogery as they call it. Mm. But it was like a totally random thing as we're driving down the road. So we get to the campground and eventually we start talking about like, well, we should go look for a place, you know, we should go see if we can stir something up. And I was like, Hey, we on our way here, we drove by this road. We should go check it out. So that's where we ended up going. And I mean, we had enough people where we had two cars and in my car, it was me and my friend and two other guys. And then everybody else was in the other vehicle. Well, you follow this road and it kind of snakes around in there. And eventually you end up at a position where the road curves off to the right and goes on down about another quarter mile or so to a dead end. But there's also like a dead end spot right there. Well, it turns out this area is actually a public hunting area. And these are access points for hunters. Didn't know that at the time or anything. But there's no vehicles down there or anything. Uh, this happened in October. So right around deer season is getting started and everything. But like I said, that's why the gates were actually open. I learned later they open them for hunters during deer season, but otherwise they stay closed. So I pulled in and I backed my vehicle in and I'm right next to the tree line. And there's this little clearing on the other side of my vehicle. And then just the woods wraps around us. And there's the dirt road that we came in on going straight in front of us. And the other vehicle curved with the road on around to the right and went on down to the dead end. We get out of the car. And I mean, as soon as we shut the doors, you start hearing something running around in the woods right next to us just instantly. And we're all like, you know, Hey, be quiet. You know, listen, what's that? And you can hear something moving around out there. Don't know what it is. We decide to get the lights. Uh, usually we stayed, uh, all dark, but we had spotlights with us if need be. And so we're getting spotlights out of the vehicle. I had already walked on a ways on the other side of the road to get away from everybody. So I could hear better. And my friend gets a spotlight out of the back of the car and starts shining the spotlight around the other two guys walk down the road a little kind of separating my friend starts saying i've got eye shine i've got eye shine and we're like okay you know like <laughs> lots of animals out here man this is like <laughs> literally his first time in the woods uh but i notice he keeps 
like his voice, <laughs> you know, it, the anxiety in his voice is picking up and he keeps on. I, I've got eye shine guys. I got, he's starting to get a little nervous. So we all kind of start walking back towards him. And, uh, I get in on my side of the vehicle to get another spotlight. And I close the door and I'm walking back towards the front of my vehicle to go around over to the tree side where he's at. All of a sudden he screams. This is a dude in his mid twenties. Okay. <laughs> he screams like a little kid and takes off running around the vehicle. Almost knocks two of us over. He, uh, threw the spotlight. He jumps inside the car, crawls over into the back seat and is like down in the seat, like just hysterical, absolutely hysterical. And we're like, what the hell, man? What the hell? Start shining the spotlight around. I'm worried about him, but like, what did he see? And I caught a glimpse in the spotlight beam through the trees of something that looked like the side of an arm and like part of a rib cage and maybe the top part of a hip as something upright. It was kind of uh rusting colored, like dead pine needles just running through this gap in the spotlight beam. So we're all shining the spotlight. Something's going on. Then I realized, you know, like, wait, my friend, <laughs> you know, like he's still freaking out. He, he wasn't just getting in the car to be safe. He's like inside the car yelling now. So I get in the car. I'm like, dude, calm down. What's wrong? He's like, take me home. Take me back home. Take me home. Take me home. So the other two guys, they're still spotlighting stuff out in the woods. I can hear them yelling and stuff. Something's going on. They're trying to get in the vehicle. Uh, I'm trying to start the vehicle. The doors are automatically locking whenever I turn the car on complete chaos now one of them's like drawn his gun and i'm just like oh my god what is happening and uh so they get back in the vehicle i get the doors unlocked and everything we radio the other people and we're like hey you guys need to come down here something's going on the other group comes we all get back out of the vehicles my friend is still in hysterics he's not talking he is trembling He's crying. I've never seen him like this. It took probably an hour or so for him to calm down enough to where like he was relaxed enough to talk. He wouldn't get out of the vehicle. What had happened was he was shining that spotlight around and he saw a collection of eyes and he just saw them like dart behind a tree. He didn't see what it was or anything. And so he's like shining the spotlight around. And then in the edge of the beam, he sees I shine again. And he said it was about a foot or so off the ground. And it was like something was leaning out from behind this tree. So he shines the spotlight back over there, trying to catch it real fast. And the eyes dart back behind the tree. And he said he was just shining it at this tree trunk. And then all of a sudden this thing, he sees first a hand, a giant hand, hairy arm, reach around the trunk of the tree and grab it. And then this hair covered thing that he said, the only thing he's ever seen, even remotely close to what it looks like is Chewbacca leans out directly into the spotlight beam. And he's just blasting it in the face with the spotlight. And whenever he saw that, that's when he screamed through the spotlight and ran into the car. I've always wondered if I would react the same way, <laughs> just because I always make comments and jokes and I'm going to be the idiot that gets killed by a Bigfoot or whatever I see, because I'm going to be the person that runs after it. Everyone runs the other direction or they freeze or whatever. Like I'm going to be the one chasing after and I said, I'm going to do it on Facebook live stream. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that, there's a proof for the world. I'm here live streaming me getting ripped apart by a Sasquatch, but I don't know. I don't know how people can really react and you can't really predict how you're going to react because. No, no, you can't. When you see something like that, you're like, it blows your mind. Because 
as much as you want to believe and you think it's out there, the moment you actually see it and it confirms everything, and then your whole world is just like mind exploding emoji, I guess. I don't know how else to describe yeah. it. Like it. I mean, I had been doing the Bigfoot stuff online and like talking to people about it, you know, nightly. We would get into this like voice chat every night and talk. I had been doing all that for like months and months and months before I ever actually went out and met up with them and went into the woods. And I had gone out with them a few times. And at the point where I had my sighting, I was with friends at that point in my mind, you know, like I knew these people. I was out there actively looking for them. I was looking at a face at a safe distance, you know, <laughs> maybe 30 yards or so at the most, uh, I've got, I'm looking at it through night vision. So there's that mental separation between reality. You know, if I take the night vision scope down, I don't see it anymore. It's not there. Uh, he, however, <laughs> he's a skeptic to the point of a non-believer. He thinks we're all crazy. He thinks his best friend's in danger because these people have to be completely off their rocker. These things don't exist. It's ridiculous. And then one staring him in the face from 10 to 15 feet away. It, it traumatized him, man. It absolutely traumatized him. He was shook for the rest of the outing. Uh, he, he eventually got out of the car hours later, but he didn't leave the car. He stayed leaning up against it. He wouldn't walk away from the vehicle. And, uh, eventually he did go back out in the woods with me, but it, it took months for me to talk him into going back out there because at that point I was like, dude, you had a sighting, you know, they're here. Come on. <laughs> you know? And he's like, mm -hmm. no, man, I don't want, I don't want nothing to do with it. And he's native American. So there's also, you know, some native American beliefs and stuff going on there where like his grandma, especially was like, you leave those things alone. You don't, you don't go looking for them. So he didn't want to have anything to do with it. He did eventually get a tattoo of one on his arm, uh, to commemorate the event that changed <laughs> his life. But yeah, man, uh, you, you don't know how you're going to react. And I don't think because you react one way, one time you'd react the same way. Another time. I, I think it depends on the situation and how the person is at the time and a lot of factors and it, it can have a very different impact on a different person. Uh, but regardless of how you react, the, the way that it changes things in you internally, I mean, that happens to everybody. If you have a sighting and you know what you saw, you, you can't go back, man. You can't, you can't close that door once it's open. No, it's almost like Pandora's box. Once it's out, it's out. That's, uh, I'll dive into that one. I talked to you on your episode, but, uh, it's definitely one of those things to where when you get into it, you experience it, even though you want to not believe in it, it still eats at you. Like to try and r rationalize and understand what it was you saw. Yeah. I don't think people ever really bring that up that often. Like they said, Oh, I saw this and this it does have an impact on people. And I even I've said this about other podcasters and other things too. And that's probably why some people don't like me, but a lot of people don't take into consideration how it impacts other people. Everyone might see it differently. And if you're someone that has never had an experience before, you cannot relate to someone who has, whether they say it or not, like, it is not the same. People say, oh, you have PTSD. I don't like throwing that out there. Like, that's not what it is. But it's, each person deals with their own things differently. And I don't like when people are just out there left and right trying to force people into talking about it. If someone wants to talk about a grave, they don't want to talk about it. You leave them alone. Yeah. Like, like everyone has to deal with it their own way. And and there's other things out there to where are these people really experienced the ones that come out there and make up all these BS stories. They're not helping anyone. No, not at all. It literally just puts worse stigma 
on the whole situation for people that actually have seen something. So it's kind of a hard thing to get through when you hear some of these fantastical stories that are getting tossed around. And then when people say, oh, you saw something, well, that's boring. Oh, I'm sorry. Like, you, my encounter was not exciting for you, I guess. Like, whatever. <laughs> so, I don't know. It's Doing this has really opened my eyes to more of what other people have experienced, more so than what I ever really thought, because I didn't know people were having all these encounters. Like, I, I used to watch Finding Bigfoot when it came out, and I literally laughed at the show because I thought it was kind of dumb. Just because it seemed so staged. And I've never spoken to any of the people involved with the show. But anything on television, I feel like a stage. There's mountain monsters. They claim those guys are really awesome guys. I've been asked to have a couple of the guys come on the show and talk to me sometime. I'd love to talk um, to them. <laughs> mountain monsters is 100% fictional. Yeah. Like, and that's what I say to people. It's like, <laughs> that show is 100% over the top stupidity. Like, it's for pure dumb entertainment. Yeah. I, I think uh, some of the guys are actually interested in the subject and stuff, and maybe have even had experiences. But I mean, I know people that know them personally who they'll matter of fact tell you, like, yeah, no, that's written. It's all fake. Like, it's just for entertainment. Uh, that's where I struggle with though. When you see the things on TV, because TV is a completely different facet of entertainment. People claim that podcasts are entertainment. I didn't see it that way, but I, I mean, I get it is, but I wasn't out here to make entertainment. Like I'm not out here trying to produce fake stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, We're, you've got documentaries and you've got action movies. They're both films, but they're mm -hmm. entirely different. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, it seems that more people are interested in the action and horror movies than are interested in the documentaries. Yeah. And there's a lot of people, uh, podcasters and, uh, you know, people that go on podcasts that realize that. And so that's, that's, you know, their profession. They they are one hundred percent entertainment, and they put those view counts before putting real information out there. You know, I've struggled a lot with that personally uh, as a podcaster, as a former researcher, as a person who's had a sighting, and then I have a podcast that's based on witnesses coming on and telling their stories. You know, I don't judge them. I don't get into arguments with them about whether I believe them or not. I don't, uh, you know, hold their feet to the fire and grill them on their details, trying to expose them in a lie or anything like that. I approach it completely different than I would approach it. If I was doing it as like an actual investigation where I'm interviewing a witness, uh, I consider it a form of entertainment. I consider it modern folklore. You know, these are the stories and I wanted to provide not only just a platform for people to be able to come on and share their stories without being attacked, because that was something that was going on heavily back in the day. Mm -hmm. But also I was coming from a background where I was always just, these things are flesh and blood. If you're saying they cloaked or you're saying, you know, it turned into an orb or mind spoke with you, you're making shit up. That's a lie. They don't do that. I had no reason to believe that they did that. But then at the same time, I didn't know that they don't do that. I was being a jackass about it, you know, and I had to do a lot of self-reflection and think about, well, think about all the paranormal experiences you've had. Think about why you're here to begin with. You know, your, your interest in ghosts because your house was haunted and you were a little kid and you were scared at night. There's none of that makes scientific sense. <laughs> like there's nothing that you've experienced that you should expect anybody to believe is true because scientifically, you know, it's never been proven. So why are you shutting the door on those people? They have a voice. They, you know, that even from a scientific approach, that's still data that needs to be documented, whether it's true, whether it's not, 
it still needs to be entered. And uh, I wanted to provide a platform where I allowed people to freely share their experiences, regardless of what those experiences were. And so that's what I did. No, that's literally same thing I do here. It's, I'm not here to prove or disprove anyone. They want to come on here and talk about their experiences. That's what I'm here for. And there's a lot of times that people have come on here and I've questioned if I believe it or not, because again, I'm a skeptic and I've told people out straight up, like, I don't have to believe what you're telling me just because it might not make sense to me, but I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm not going to argue with anyone about it either because I don't know. I wasn't I mean, there. Yeah. Who am I to tell somebody that they didn't experience what they say they experienced? Exactly. And I've had people tell me that about my own stuff. I was like, MF, were you sitting there? <laughs> yeah. Were you right there with when all this went down? You were right there with me. Like you were there when you with us. Like there's no way. So yeah. how's someone going to criticize someone else when they weren't there to see it themselves? And that's why I, I said I do what I do because I feel like from being personally in their situation of being ridiculed, being laughed at, being whatever. No one has a place to talk about stuff like that. Otherwise you're looked at like you're freaking crazy. So, yeah. I mean, I, I've told people, I've, I've told people that have come on the show that look, I'm getting something out of this too, beyond the realm of a view or a download or whatever. It's helping me cope with what I experienced. It's yep. helping me understand the things that I experienced. And it is so refreshing to be able to talk to somebody else who has had a similar experience or has gone through the emotional process that you've gone through in the situation. And just knowing that like, not everybody out there is going to roll their eyes. Not everybody out there thinks you you're crazy. And there are a small number of individuals on this planet that can actually relate to what you experienced. And that is a huge help to people that have gone through this sort of thing. Yeah. I've even said, uh, like, don't take everything I say is the truth as in, I question my own sanity when it comes to my own experience. I've looked every single way I can to rationalize it. And I said, maybe I'm mistaken. Like that makes more sense. Is that trying to discredit my own self? Yeah. Just, just because part of me doesn't want to accept that. And I don't know why I do that, but it, it, it is what it is. And I look at towards other people too. It's like, I'm not here to tell someone that what the guest come on here says is a hundred percent accurate. There could be the human mind has a way of coping and you have traumatic events and some people, their brains function in a way to shield them from some certain things. And I've said this before with alien abductions. What if, the aliens didn't come in your room at night and did things to you. What, what if it was something else in your brain has now processed that into alien? You know what I mean? Like yeah. They're, yeah, they're covering yeah. up a traumatic event from an early it, childhood and you've manifested aliens as the ones that abused you. There was a person that came on my podcast and we were talking about their experiences, uh, with some possible UFO stuff. And at one point in the interview, it got to an area where I was just like, do you think that you've been abducted by aliens? And they said that they think they have. And just immediately I said, uh, I no longer feel comfortable about discussing that. I don't, I don't feel that that's in an area where I even need to be messing with that. That requires somebody that, knows a lot more about things than I do uh, because people do cover up things like trauma and people also are traumatized by things that they're not covering up, but trying to process it and everything. Uh, so that's a very dangerous area to get into, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the psychology behind the events and everything, you know, you were talking about earlier PTSD. I also don't like, uh, throwing PTSD out there, I would never put this in the same line as like 
say a veteran who actually suffers from PTSD. All right. Uh, in my mind, it's completely different, but there's definitely some people are definitely psychologically affected for the rest of their lives after experiencing some of these things. And rightfully so, you know, you're having reality ripped apart right before your eyes and you're in a situation where you've experienced something and you feel completely isolated and alone because the vast majority of the planet doesn't believe you or wouldn't believe you. And they'd think something was wrong with you if you ever told them about it. And, and that's the part that I think, uh, needs to go away, you know, that I'm trying to help <laughs> and I, you know, people like you are trying to help, uh, trying not everybody the, is the stigma behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Not everybody is in this, uh, just for the reason of cashing in or, you know, having these big fantastical stories. I think somebody seeing a Bigfoot cross the road in front of them is just as important and worthy of hearing as somebody who says one kicked in their door and dragged them out of bed, uh, you know? I've heard some pretty entertaining ones that lately that I'm not going to bring up because if I do, <laughs> yeah, everyone will know don't. exactly <laughs> who I'm talking about, but there is a lot of, uh, stories. I will use the word stories in this one. I know it bothers people if I say stories, but these to me are stories because I, I just, I'm not saying they're lying, but there are way too many Hollywood moments. <laughs> into some, some of these some stories seem harder to believe than others for me yeah. personally but i also know as a podcaster as anybody who is in the public eye uh it is very easy especially whenever it comes to topics like bigfoot and the paranormal and ufos to really fall into a cult type mentality <laughs> where it I know that I have the ability if I wanted to, which I never would, but I could push my own personal beliefs on different subjects through my show and my audience, the people that listen to me regularly, a good portion of them would start having those same opinions and they would start defending those opinions publicly. They would start attacking people that didn't agree with those opinions. I've seen it happen time and time and time again, uh, which is another thing that skeptics often do is compare these beliefs and stuff to religion and cults. And it's because it's true. <laughs> There's a lot of that type mentality, that type of behavior that exists in these areas. I've said recently that the cryptid communities just from in this podcasting realm, they're very cult like. Just because you have specific shows and other things like, and you have their followers and their listeners and everything else, they look towards these people that do the shows and they believe everything these people say. And if you look at it as an outsider, because I don't consider myself a podcaster, this is all new to me. And I'm very observant as a person. So I'm like, I guess I'm the creep that hangs out in the back with my arms crossed and keeps an eye on what's going on and watches everyone else's behaviors or whatever, but that's how I've always been. That's even what I do for a living. And I notice things and I see things and it's just like, there's a lot of cult vibes within these communities and not even just this, but like even in the music scene, like they are very cult like vibes, tribalism, whatever you want to call it. And there's a lot of gatekeeping and yeah. I don't get it. I really don't, but to each his own, like, I'm not going to go down that, uh, beating on that war drum and get a uh, canceled today, but you know, <laughs> no, but it's true. It's, it's definitely true. I mean, there's, uh, and I've seen it forever, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. not just this area. Like you're saying, it's any area where there's any sort of, uh, parasocial activities going on where people. Uh, feel like they are connected to whoever, you know, uh, they feel like they have to believe the way they believe, 
talk the way they talk, dress the way they dress, act the way they act. And they feel that anybody that has an opinion that goes against that person, that they have to uh, defend that person. They have to defend them entirely. I mean, ICP comes to mind for some reason. <laughs> Juggalos. <laughs> I wasn't thinking Juggalos, but it, it does line up with that. And I'll just throw this out there. Uh, I used to be a big fan of ICP back when I was like 14. So back in, <laughs> back in like the mid 90s. So I wouldn't say I was a juggalo, but there, there is a video floating around of me and my best friend painted up as the ICP guys lip syncing. to this. Well, there you go. <laughs> Those are before the internet days of, uh, YouTube or TikTok or whatever. So if I ever find that video, I'll make sure to become a uh, famous by it. <laughs> yeah. No, there is a, I just want everyone and I know it's, wishful thinking it'll never happen but i just wish for everyone to just not be so and i don't know what the proper term to be would <laughs> without just, offending anyone yeah like there, you know, there isn't one yeah <laughs> just to be good people we'll just yeah. say like, calm down yeah like there is enough room for what we're doing there's enough room in general for any type of quote unquote entertainment that it doesn't have to be the way it is. And no. I think if everyone could understand that things would be a lot better. But for some reason, I think a lot of things actually, some people enjoy that. That is their entertainment. Oh, for sure. So for sure. again, it, it it's a, it's a platform for whatever anyone wants to do. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's right. I don't really care what anyone else does, but I think it does more harm than good, but that's just my opinion. And you know what? My opinion doesn't mean anything. I'm a guy with a microphone. Yeah, same. Same. At the end of the day, nobody's opinions matter. Nope. Uh, not At least not past an individual <laughs> level, you know? I don't care if... Uh, Somebody listens to my podcast and they're just like, and this dude's full of shit. I hate him. <laughs> that, that's fine. <laughs> You're free to listen to whatever you want to. Uh, I don't get mad if somebody that listens to my show listens to somebody else's show. I don't care if they listen to somebody else that I don't even like. Uh, it, it's fine. There's room for everybody. Yep. And that is, and I'm, so I'm, I'm not a, big podcast person. I don't listen to a whole lot of stuff. I recently started listening to your stuff when we started talking because I was, I never really knew much about you. So I was like, well, I'm going to look into your show and I've been listening to the last four or five episodes when I get a chance, but I don't have a whole lot of free time to listen to podcasts. I'm either doing my own show or I'm working or I'm doing stuff with my family. I don't have the three hours a day driving like I used to. So I don't have that, uh, free time to be listening to the podcast and I'm, there's I'm friends with several other podcasters, so I try and keep up with everyone that I talk to show, but I also don't like listening to podcasts because I don't want to emulate someone. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be like, yeah, yeah. Subconsciously influenced by what they're doing. Like I'd rather just be my own stupidity, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I think, uh, we can probably about wrap this one up. I do want you to let everyone know again where they can check you out at, find your podcast, whatever you've been up to. I would assume uh, anywhere you find tinfoil tails, you can find Bigfoot Crossroads. No. Um, there's always BigfootCrossroads.com, you know, Spotify, Apple, all those good things, YouTube. Anywhere you look, you'll probably find it. It's not hard to find. You type in Bigfoot and it's one of the first ones to pop up. So finally, yeah, I, I noticed that cause I use Apple. I typed in Bigfoot and then there were several that popped up, but you were one of the first ones that was on there. So you've, you've made it on Apple. <laughs> yes. Good thing. I didn't call it Sasquatch crossroads. Yeah. There, there's a few of those. It might be a, might be a little touchy on that one. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to come on here today and talk with me. Yeah, uh, man. We've been chatting back and forth, so it's nice to actually sit down and have a conversation that's not words on a screen. 
Yeah. Yeah. I've enjoyed it. It's uh nice to be on the other side every once in a while. Yeah. I uh, said that too. I don't go on too many shows. I've been on a few here and there, but it's strange for me because I don't want to be the center of attention. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like to talk. You don't want to be the center of attention. Started a podcast. Good job. And used to be a front man. <laughs> he used to be a front man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, everyone, I mean, maybe I'm the walking hypocrite. I don't know. I just, yeah, I don't know. Like I said, if anyone knows me for outside of this, I'm pretty quiet, nonchalant. Like people have conversations. And I'll just sit there all day and never say a word unless someone speaks to me. Like, that's just how I am. <laughs> like, I don't interject <laughs> myself. I'm like, oh, what's your opinion on this? And then I'll talk for like 45 minutes. You're like, this dude never shuts up. <laughs> Why did I ask him that? <laughs> no. Why did he get so self-loathingly <laughs> preachy at me? <laughs> well, Matt, again, it's been a pleasure. Everyone check out Bigfoot Crossroads. Wherever you listen to Tinfoil Tales, you can find it there, too. So, again, thanks to Matt, and thanks for listening. Remember, the truth lies in the stories we share, the connections we make. Stay curious, stay open-minded. Thank you all for joining us on this journey, and until next time, keep questioning, keep seeking, and keep exploring the unknown. Good night, everyone.